Hello and welcome to another episode of Community Update. My name is Idara Osanga. I will be your host. The essence of leadership is relationship, influencing people to achieve things together. Our guest today is a true leader in the Black community here in Nova Scotia. Anne Divine is the founder and CEO of Ashanti Leadership and Professional Development Services. She spends her time working with individuals, businesses, and corporations, providing leadership while leading them to build capacity in critical thinking, employee engagement, and trust building. Anne's work is supported by her knowledge and expertise in human rights and people management. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Anne. Thank you very much, Idara. You are well known for your community activities here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. You believe strongly in giving back to your community. What motivates you? Well, I'm motivated by seeing other individuals achieve their ambitions. Uh, I'm motivated by um, people on their journey to success. I am motivated by so many things. It could be a movie, it could be uh, something that I'm reading that has captured my attention, as well as uh, motivated by the things that I've done in my youth, in my childhood, um, seeing my parents, how they challenged themselves to succeed, how they encouraged us and um, really pushed us to do the very best that we can. And like my son reminded me today that when I was pushing them and trying to motivate them to achieve their best, it wasn't about the color of our skin. It was about getting your education and it was about achieving the best that you can in life and be of service to others. Thank you so much, Anne. Over the years, your work has no doubt brought you into spaces with many individuals from different uh, parts of life. So tell us what it is like working with people from diverse cultures and communities and owning your space. Well, I, I believe I've been owning my space for a long time now. Mm -hmm. I didn't just arrive in Nova Scotia to own my space. I've been doing that in the UK uh, of where I was raised. And I remember one of the things, the first things that I started, I was the, the secretary to my church community and Leading was one of the things that I had been doing for a long time. Not being afraid, for example, being the only black woman in the room. Uh, it's, it's the story of our lives, as it were. But we have to be confident. We have to believe in ourselves. When I was growing up, I thought confidence was something that was given to you. But I soon realized that confidence is something that you have to grab. You have to go out and take it with both hands. And um, by so doing, then you can own your space. Be knowledgeable about the conversation that you're having with individuals. Be prepared. I've often said when I'm doing something, I have to plan, plan and leave room for the unplanned because anything can happen. Someone's going to throw a wrench at you and you've got to know how to respond and to respond in a way that you're going to maintain your integrity. And I have to do that every day with the different people that I meet, whether if they might be a white male who wants to speak over me and tell me what he thinks I am worth, or whether if it's um, somebody else who is challenging my authority at all times, regardless of your race or your gender. So you have to be able to own your space, be confident, know your worth, know your value because if you don't other people is going to define your value and your worth for you you recently received an award being recognized as one of the 25 most powerful women in atlantic canada business how do you feel about this give us some insight on how you feel <laughs> <laughs> well i was really surprised and taken aback when i got the call to say this is what was going to happen and moreover, I couldn't tell anyone about it. There was an embargo, so I could only speak to my family and friends. I couldn't broadcast it, but it was an honor uh, because I, I feel it was a reward for what I've been doing since I arrived in Canada in 2004. 
when I first came to Canada, I didn't have a job for a long time. And my job really was to mentor and to support other immigrant women like myself who were highly qualified. We all had our masters, some had their PhDs, but they couldn't find appropriate work because people said that they didn't have Canadian experience. I remember one of the ladies I was mentoring, she said to me, I went to do some volunteering work because everyone said to volunteer, volunteer. And then they told me that I needed Canadian experience to peel potatoes. So can you imagine that? <laughs> oh no, that's, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Uh, that is, uh, that's amazing to hear how far you've come. And talking about business, how would you describe the state of black owned businesses in Nova Scotia today? Just looking back from when you first got into the business spaces here. People in Nova Scotia, black people in Nova Scotia have always been in business. They've had to do it for themselves. And certainly when I came to Nova Scotia, they were individuals, they were businesses, successful businesses. When you think about Sure Shot, that um, dispensing, a, a huge business in Lower Sackville, uh, they, they, they were dispensing, they invented, the owner of that business invented um, the machine that dispenses our milk when we go to Tim Hortons. Then we had things like Simmons Pavement, Jeannie knows individuals who were doing some really innovative and creative things. Uh, but it was a struggle because people weren't willing to give loans to um, black people. I remember a woman saying to me, she has a tailoring business here and it had been, she had been in business for over 25 years. And in the winter, there was a chip on her side of the pavement and she went and asked her bank for a loan of $5,000 and they told her no. So can you imagine that? Um, people didn't value what we bring. The Black Business Initiative was always working for black people here in Nova Scotia and supporting them in whatever businesses they were in. But following the death of George Floyd, I recognize that the government has started giving money to people of color, started giving money to black people, to establish themselves in business, recognizing that they, they were, there was a struggle. Certainly when I started out, I did it all by myself. I didn't have a loan from anyone. The bank wouldn't entertain it. So I continued and I used my own savings and I worked hard to raise my own funding until I, I became independent enough to earn an income for myself and not only for myself, but I also have a group of individuals, subject matter experts who work with me and for me in my business. And I see myself as providing opportunities for other individuals now. And that's what we have to do. When we get into positions where we can share um, our expertise and our knowledge, we have to remember that there are other young people who are coming up. They too need our support. We have to reach out and lend them a hand. We have to mentor them because there aren't too many people who mentor us in, in black business. We have to support them, encourage them and show them the way. If I get an opportunity and I know something that is going on that I can share with someone else, I'd be only too happy to do that because that's the only way that we're going to succeed. Connecting to that, how important is it for people of color in this province to be economically empowered? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Being economically empowered is one of the ways that we are going to succeed and that we can demonstrate who we really are. Um, people need to recognize that as black people, indigenous people, people of color, that we have so much to offer, our innovativeness, our creativity, all the things that comes with who we are, that is often overlooked. So um, the more independent we are, setting up our own form of um, lending processes. You know, when we were growing up as children, we know that our parents had um, different ways that they would do their microfinancing to support their own businesses. We can still do that. We have to build trust amongst ourselves we have to support each other 
And we have to encourage each other. We have to shop in our own community. Our dollars should go around. That dollar should go around in our community more than four times or three times. If it went around 11 times as it does in other communities, our community will be a force to reckon with. That's my belief. So we were talking to a guest on the show recently who believes there's a little divide between the African Nova Scotian community and other Blacks. Do you share this view just based on your position in the community? Do you see this happen? I am privileged to be embraced by all members in our community. Mm -hmm. And what I would say to individuals who feel that they are marginalized, we have to open ourselves to each other. When I first came to Nova Scotia, there was a lot of negativity about African Nova Scotians. There were negativities about indigenous people, negativities about immigrants like myself. But I moved past that because I had to get to know the African Nova Scotian community by going in, sitting down, having, in fact, they invited me. My husband came here as a uh, the professor uh, of social work and the James R. Johnson chair in Black Canadian Studies. So I had an in into the community, but I wasn't interested. People embraced me. And so especially when we had a, a point of crisis in our lives, when my husband had a major accident, the entire community it didn't matter whether if you were African Nova Scotians, whether if you were immigrants, we just they just embraced us. And so I got to know the communities very well. And when we sit down and we share our common, our share, our learn from each other, we get to know about each other's differences. And we realize that as black people, the struggle is the same and we are not so different after all. We might be geographically, but my goodness, when we're walking down the streets, people see two black women. They're not interested in whether if, whether if we're African Nova Scotians, whether if we are from the continent of Africa, or whether if we are from England. They just see black people and we're treated the same way. What we need to do is to work together and support each other even more. You are a visionary who a lot of people look up to. What would your recommendation be on how to improve the level of engagement among people of color here in Nova Scotia? have those critical conversations, talk to each other, share our stories, talk about our values. What is our purpose? What is it the thing that motivates us? What is our passion? Because when we do that, we realize that there, we have so many things in common. Let's not separate ourselves from each other because nothing gets done that way. But the more we come together, the more we value each other, the more we recognize each other for what we can bring to the table, the better we will all be. And I, I, I really believe in that wholeheartedly because um, yes, not every, I'm, I, I don't think everybody is, um, would be in favor of me or see me as the most popular person, which I don't see myself as such. If I go into the streets and I see another black person or I see a young black woman working in a particular area, I go up to them and I talk to them and I ask them about themselves and I give them my contact details and I said, follow me on LinkedIn. And that's how I get to know and to share my thoughts and experiences with other young people so that they too can progress. Thank you, Anne. So one thing we cannot deny living in this part of the world is the fact that racism exists and still presents a huge challenge in spaces we exist in. As someone who has worked in senior management positions in the UK, in Canada, and someone who champions diversity, equity, and inclusive leadership, have you experienced racism in your career and your journey so far? And have you handled it? We've all... I'm sure, experience racism in one way or another. Um, I seek the support from my family, first of all, when that happens. I seek the support from my friends. Um, I don't call people out unless if it's absolutely necessary. Uh, that's when I'll call them out. But what I would do is that I would call them in, have a quiet word, let them know that their behavior is unacceptable and that um, I wouldn't stand for it. 
I stand up for myself. We have to be in a position where we are confident enough and not everyone can do that, but I would stand up for myself. It happens to all of us. I was in a bookstore where I go to get my, um, my books. I've been going there ever since I've been in Nova Scotia and I had felt the presence of someone following me. And um, I moved and then that individual followed me again. And eventually I lift up my head and I said, am I being followed here? I stood in the middle of the shop and I said, am I being followed here? And the person said, no, 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 I'm not. But you are following me. And everyone stopped and they were looking around. But, you know, we have to stand up for ourselves. We're being followed. We're not being given. Thank goodness there are people who are doing um, products for our skin care, products for our hair care. We didn't have that. Those things were locked away for a long time in the stores because they felt black people steal. We, we face racism every day in our experience, but we have become champions as individuals in learning to cope with the challenges that we face on a daily basis because it's the way of life. It doesn't matter where we go, we will always face, but we have to be confident enough to stand up for ourselves and advocate for ourselves and others as well. I definitely agree with you. In the course of your journey so far, has imposter syndrome ever posed an issue to you? <laughs> oh my goodness. I face that all the time. <laughs> Feeling that you're not good enough is something that plagues us mm -hmm. all. Uh, once you're in a position where you're the lone woman of color or black woman in the room and nobody else is there. You question yourself, should I be here? Uh, am, I, am I really worth it? it am I, what am I going to say is it of value? I get nervous and I get anxious and I have to breathe, breathe and breathe. And I've actually stopped myself feeling as though I'm an imposter because I'm there because I'm worth something of worth and people value me. So what I do, I try not to think about that anymore. I try to recognize that if I'm thinking about that, there's so much that I'm missing that's happening over my head. So let me breathe, sit down and take it all in and use my knowledge to educate those individuals around me and the knowledge that I gain from them. I use that to educate the individuals who I am working with, the individuals that I want to motivate the women, black women, women of color, who are aiming to achieve and want to be successful. That's my role. I see myself as someone who should be of service, not just to my community, but um, to anyone who I encounter. Uh, that's what I would like to um, be known for. Someone who was willing to share, someone who didn't hold back, someone who gave and was willing to engage. Thank you so much, Anne. I know we could go on and on because you have such a wealth of experience to share, but time would not permit. So before I let you go, what advice would you drop for our viewers today? Just as a <laughs> woman of color, as a person of color navigating spaces here. Uh, be your authentic self. Show up when you have to show up show up on time, uh, be positive about the opportunities that you have, that you've been given, and um, be your authentic self. That's what I try to do. And that's what people value more than anything else. And know your worth, because somebody else is going to tell you what they think you're worth. Ask to be paid for what you are worth, because you've put in the work. If not, you won't get paid. Thank you so much, Anne. I'm afraid this is all the time we have on the show today. Thank you so much for stopping by. We look forward to connecting with you in the near future and just hearing you speak. Thank you very much. That was Anne Devine, the founder and CEO of Ashanti Leadership and Professional Development Services. We reached her in Halifax. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel and get notified when we post the next update. I am Idaro Sanga and I will see you soon.